with us, those who are actively engaged on the foreign field, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of you have been there, some for long periods, some for short periods. Uh, those of our young people who have gone on short-term mission trips have certainly uh, received a great blessing from that. But today we have a, a very special person with us. We have Brother Ken Olson, who, uh, while this church was without a pastor, many times filled the pulpit here. So he's no stranger to us. And it is with joy that we welcome him today, Brother Olson. Well, it's a pleasure to be back here again in Collingswood. And uh, we come from the land of Brazil, although I visited the land of Cameroon this past week, where we were in the past, but now we're missionaries in Brazil. And we want to invite all of you to come to Brazil next January to the ICCC, uh, they're in Brazil, January 23rd to 28th. And so make your plans to go there. You know, uh, Brazil is, as I said last night, uh, Brazil is the great place for ev great events in the world today. 2014, the World Cup of Soccer will be there. 2016, the Olympics will be in Brazil. And 2012, next January, the International Council of Christian Churches will be in Brazil. And so we'd really love to see some people here from Collingswood to go to our International Council of Christian Churches meeting. And of course, uh, Collingswood is no stranger to the ICCC. It was originated here and was headquartered from here uh, for many years, and uh, now we're seeking to continue on uh, the ministry of the ICCC around the world. We had stage one of our Congress last October in the Philippines, 
And now we have stage two, uh, more for people here in the Western Hemisphere, down in Brazil in January. Let's turn our Bibles to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, and starting with verse 1. Ezekiel 33 and verse 1. Uh, we read earlier from verses 23 and on, and we'll go there in a little bit. But first we want to go back to 33.1. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts, and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet, and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his head. He heard the sound of the uh, trumpet, and look, took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. Let's bow in prayer, O Lord. We just thank thee for the opportunity that we have to be in thy house this morning once again. And, O Lord, we pray that thou would open our hearts to behold wondrous things out of thy law and out of thy word. And, O Lord, help us to see in the message of Ezekiel uh, things that we can see and use in our world today. And we thank thee that thy word is, is up to date for today, every part of it. And, O oh Lord, help us to look to thy word always for guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we have Ezekiel for today. And you know, there's no new thing under the sun. That which is, has been will be, and that which will be has been. As Solomon said back in the book of Ecclesiastes, and Ezekiel, he lived in a day such as our day, a day of apostasy, a day where people have turned away from God. And, but they had a form of godliness. On um, outward appearances, they seem to have been, you know, in a revival, people serving the Lord. But really, that was not the case. And Ezekiel told them that that was not the case. Well, here we have Ezekiel. He starts out the chapter here talking about the watchman. About a watchman. It says, when I bring the sword upon a land... The people will take a watchman to watch for the danger that comes. And back in these days, they had the walled towns, the walled cities, fenced cities, and uh, that was for a great purpose because it were, they were dangerous times and there were marauding bands that went around the countryside and uh, bands of men that would attack people. And so they would have the watchman up on the top of the city or in a watchtower. And he'd always be scanning to see uh, when the marauding bands would come. And he would give them warning. He would sound the trumpet. And, of course, he would give a good, good, clear sound on the trumpet. And the people would go and lock themselves up in the fenced city, and they would be safe from the marauding bands. And they would be safe from the danger that was without well, you know, that was, those were back in the days before gunpowder. Uh, after gunpowder came on the scene, walled cities didn't make much difference because uh, they would take cannons and, and knock down the city with the cannons. Uh, the city of Constantinople stood for a thousand years against the attacks of the Muslims and others. And, but finally, when gunpowder came on the scene, the city fell. But here, they would go into the fenced city and take refuge. And you know, it was a great responsibility to be a watchman. A watchman up on the wall. Everybody in the city depended upon the watchman to do his job. And if the watchman fell asleep, if the watchman wasn't doing his job, well, the people in the city could be slaughtered and killed and spoiled. And so the watchman was up there. He had a great responsibility as through all warfare, all times, uh, somebody that's on guard duty 
has a great responsibility. Uh, you know, in wartime, it's a pu an offense punishable by death for uh, a guard to fall asleep on duty, a watchman to fall asleep on duty. It's not uh, something that's uh, lightly looked upon. Uh, remember when the uh, soldiers were at the tomb of Jesus? The soldiers were there, and uh, this, the body of Jesus disappeared. He was resurrected. Uh, but you know, uh, they would normally have been put to death because they were there to watch. But yet the Jews delivered them there. Well, it was a great responsibility that the watchmen had. And so then it says here in verse 4, if somebody heard the sound of the trumpet, they didn't take warning, well, their blood would be upon their own head. Why would somebody not take warning? when the watchman would sound the trumpet. Well, he might not believe it. He might not believe that the enemy really was coming. And so he would not take warning. He would go about his normal affairs, and he would be killed by the enemy. And uh, But if the watchman gave the warning, and the people didn't take uh, warning, well, the watchman would still deliver his own soul. He would give his job in full, and he would do what was required of him. His blood. But if the watchman, verse 6, sees the trumpet come, and he blows not the trumpet, well, his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. During the Civil War, uh, there were people in the Civil War that were agitating against the war. And President Lincoln, he put them in jail, and he didn't allow any... Uh, uh, protest against the war, and he gave us his reasoning, well, if I have to put to death a, a poor uh, young soldier that falls asleep at guard, uh, how can I let these people agitate against the war? Well, the problem with that is, is the people that were agitating against the war were civilians. The guy on guard duty is a guy that is entrusted with responsibility from his unit, from the army, and he has a job that has a penalty of death for not doing it. Well, Ezekiel, verse 7, he was set as a watchman for the country of Israel. And, O oh, son of man, I have set thee as a watchman. Hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. This is the same thing we have with the Great Commission today. We're supposed to go out and warn the world, give them the good news that they can escape the judgment to come. And we are watchmen today. We can see the judgment of God on the horizon. And we need to give the people around us warning from God. And God has given us that as our responsibility that we need to fulfill. But now first let's go down, before we look more at that, let's go down to verse 23. Verse 23 where we were reading earlier. And here Ezekiel is talking about the situation in the world around him in his time. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is given us for an inheritance. And here we have the Jews at this time. They were out in the wastelands and the desolate areas, and they looked back to the Abrahamic covenant back in the Old Testament. And back in the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham was promised, and his descendants were promised, the land of Israel. And so these descendants here, the Jews in the time of Ezekiel, they decided, well, we're descendants of Abraham. The land is given to us. And we're going to claim the, the land for us. Uh, we have this promise to Abraham, and we're going to name that promise, and we're going to claim that promise. Does that sound like anything in the world today? Well, we have the people all around us today having name it and claim it. Name the promises of God's word and claim them for yourselves. Well, we have Brazil is full of that, just full of it. And there's a lot of it here in the United States as well. Name it and claim it. And there's big, huge amounts of people that gather to these churches that preach this name it and claim it. And they all want to grab a hold of the promises of God and the promises of prosperity, the promises of good health. They want to grab a hold of all these promises 
And they want to claim them for themselves. And the preachers tell them, well, go ahead and claim all these promises for yourselves. God wants to give you what you want. And of course, that's a real religion of the flesh. And the people come out by millions to that religion of the flesh today, name it and claim it. And you know, today we're in a day of an apostasy. We're in a day when people have turned away from the Lord. And, uh, you know, there's some people have said to me, Oh, I hear that there's revival going on in Brazil. Well, don't you believe it? There's a, it looks like revival. There's a lot of people in church. Everybody's a Christian down there. They, at least they say they are. But the land is in bad shape. And the crime is terrible. The sin is terrible in the land. And it's not a land of revival. Well, we have the name it and claim it. People promising people that. And back here in Ezekiel's time, they were naming and claiming the promises of God. The only problem was, what did God have to say about that? Did God say that they could name his promises and claim them? No. God had the opposite to say about their naming and claiming. We have verse 25. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land? Ye stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, ye defile every one his neighbor's wife, and shall ye possess the land? God had something else to say about this naming and claiming. And it's not just enough to say with our mouth that we're going to claim the promises of God. We have to be one of God's children. We have to pray and ask for the forgiveness of sins. We have to give our life to the Lord. And then we have to be serving the Lord with our whole heart and trying to keep God's commandments and serve Him. Well, the problem is with these name it and claim it people today and back in Ezekiel's time, they thought it was just, religion is just a matter of the mouth. Just say the words, just like a mantra that you're saying, a formula that you're saying, and that's all there is to it. But that's not all there is to it. We have to live for the Lord day by day. We have to serve Him with our whole heart. We have to abandon sin behind. And that was the problem in Ezekiel's time. They were living in sin, and yet they were naming and claiming the promises of God. And Ezekiel here names their different sins, at least some of them. They were eating with the blood. That was against the law that they weren't supposed to eat blood back in the Old Testament. They were serving idols. They were serving the idols of the... Uh, the uh, Edomites, the uh, Moabites, and all the other rites around them, they were serving these idols, and yet at the same time, they were naming and claiming the promises of God. Well, we can't do that. You know, we might think we'll get away with that. We'll think that we'll be able to name and claim it, and God will give us what we want. But that's not how it is. That's not how God looks upon it. And, you know, of course, we don't bow down to idols today, like Molech, uh, but we do bow down to the idols of money, houses, cars, uh, all kinds of different idols today. And uh, we need to turn away from those idols and serve God first with our whole heart. Anything that's an idol is something that we serve first in our lives more than God. And then back in this time, they were shedding blood. Verse 26, they were standing upon their sword. It was a time of great violence. And yet they were naming and claiming the promises of God. The very ones who were violently attacking people, robbing them, they were the ones that were naming and claiming the promises of God. And we have that in Brazil today. We have that big time. We have things on the TV where it shows people committing crime and they're praying as they're committing the crime. They're crossing themselves as they commit the crime. And they think they can get away with that. But they don't get away with it. Ye stand upon your sword. And of course, Brazil is a place of great violence, although we don't want to discourage you from coming to the ICCC. Uh, normally, you don't see too much of that violence day to day in your life, fortunately. But there's plenty of it out there in Brazil. 
ye stand upon your sword, ye work abomination, and ye defile every one his neighbor's wife. The land is just full of adultery here in the United States, in Brazil, and yet we have people naming and claiming the promises of God, talking about God. And it doesn't work like that. We have to serve God. We have to leave our sin behind. Well, then we go on here, verse 27. Say thou thus unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, As I live, surely they that are in the waste shall fall by the sword, and them that is in the open field will I give to the beasts to be devoured, and they that be in the forts and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. Well, these are these people in the waste that are naming and claiming the promises of God. What does God say about them? They weren't going to get the promise of God of the land. They were going to get the sword. They were going to get beasts, deadly beasts, and pestilence, disease. You know, the problem is, these people, they were remembering the Abrahamic covenant, and they were forgetting the Mosaic covenant. They remembered the promises to Abraham, but they forgot that in the Mosaic co Covenant there are blessings upon obedience and curses upon disobedience with God. And they forgot those curses upon disobedience. Well, here God was going to send his judgment upon them. And Ezekiel, as a watchman, he was telling them about this judgment coming. He was seeing the beasts, the pestilence, the sword coming as a watchman, and he was telling them about it. But they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't take warning, and those things came upon them. You know, uh, does God use calamities in the world around us? Why was there a Hurricane Katrina? Why are there other calamities? Why was there the, the suffering from the hurricane that came here just recently, even though it wasn't near as much as thought people thought would be? You know, why does suffering come into the world? Well, suffering is one of the main tools that God uses in this world. And when things are going great with somebody, a person really doesn't want to think about God because everything's going great. But it's when things start going bad, when there's big problems, that's when they start thinking about God and turning to Him. And so God sends those things to bring people back to Himself. Well, here we have the Mosaic Covenant, and we have these tools that God used. And then verse 28, For I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, and none shall pass through. Well, the pomp of her strength. We have a lot of pomp today, a lot of pride here in America and in Brazil. Well, the pomp of her strength shall cease. It was really interesting with that earthquake that came, that it didn't do much damage, but it cracked the Washington Monument. So the Washington Monument is closed, and it knocked the top off the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Well, I think that was just symbolic from the Lord, that the Lord wants to get the attention of America that has departed from him. And you know, we think we're so powerful today, we think that we're, we could, if man bands together, he can do anything he wants, he can, he can conquer the world, conquer all the evil in the world. Well, it doesn't work like that. When the hurricane came up through, uh, the, the best that man could do, they couldn't even predict exactly what was going to happen or where it was going to go. And, uh, you know, in that hurricane, that should have given a signal to America. They said that that hurricane affected more people, more millions of people in the United States than any hurricane in history. They were evacuating people from New York. They were evacuating, had mandatory evacuations six miles from me uh, there in Delaware where our house is. But yet, people don't take warning. And our job today as Christians is to give warning to the world around us of the coming judgment of God and the fact that there is a way of escape, that God has provided a way through Jesus so we can have the forgiveness of sins and we can escape the judgment of God. Well, then we go down to verse 30. Verse 30. Here we have Ezekiel talking to the people and giving them warning. Also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, 
and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And so Ezekiel's time was just like today. And in Ezekiel's time, they had a crowd of people coming to hear what Ezekiel had to say. And it said here they were talking against him. Uh, even as they were coming to hear him, they were speaking against him, and I'm sure they were saying that he was too narrow, too old, too much of an extremist, too much of a radical. And they were talking against him, but still, they came unto him and wanted to hear, at least by curiosity, what the old narrow man had to say. And they came as God's people come. They came as my people, as God's people. And they heard the words that Ezekiel had to say. And in Brazil, we've got millions of people in church. Oh, we've got huge churches. In the United States, we've got huge churches, huge crowds. They come as the people come. They come as my people. They hear the words, but they will not do them. They will not do them. And you know, if all those millions of people that are in church were doing the word of God, this would be a different country. Brazil would be a much different country. But they're not doing the word of God. They're just coming as God's people, but they really aren't God's people. And they really have it just in Ezekiel's time, just like today. With their mouth, they show much love. With their mouth. Talk is cheap, they say, and it is cheap. And it's easy to say things, but it's a lot harder to do them. With their mouth, they show much love. And you know, we're full of churches in the U.S. and Brazil where they get together and they say, Oh no, let everybody tell Jesus how much you love him. Well, Jesus said, did Jesus say, If ye love me, tell me how much you love me? No, he never said that. He said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. And, you know, they keep on saying, oh Lord, give me the Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit down. Well, that's not the pattern we have in the Bible to just keep on talking about it. No, it's as we're serving the Lord, as we're doing what he wants us to do, then he sends the Holy Spirit upon us. And that's how we show that we love him. But back in Ezekiel's time, their mouth, they show much love. And it's very interesting in Ezekiel's time, their heart goeth after their covetousness. That's the big gospel in Brazil today. The gospel of prosperity. Prosperity. And we have preachers all over in Brazil, I'm sure, and they're in the United States too, preaching that gospel of prosperity, that God wants to prosper you. God wants to give you money. God wants to, you to financially prosper. And they pick promises out of the Bible, out of context, and quote them, that God wants to prosper you. Their heart goeth after their covetousness. Well, you know, it fits in very well with Brazil today, that gospel of prosperity, because the country is coming up slowly. It is prospering. You can see signs of prosperity coming there in Brazil, and so these prosperity preachers, they latch into that, and it goes well, at least right now, in most cases. But you know, does God preach, does God tell us that he wants everybody to be financially prosperous? No, he doesn't tell us that. That many times he'll prosper us financially, but he does not promise everybody at all times to be financially prosperous. God does not pros uh, promise that. He promises us that he will be with us. He promises us that, that he will be with us through our problems. And he promises us eternal life. But he doesn't promise us nece necessarily a bed of roses here on this earth. Now remember the rich man and Lazarus in the Bible? Who was the Christian? It was Lazarus, the beggar, laid at the gate full of sores. 
He was the Christian. He was the true Christian. And he was, he was one that was right with the Lord. He went to heaven. And yet, he was very, very, very poor. Well, their heart goeth after their covetousness. Well, why wouldn't millions of people come to those churches where they preach, God wants you rich, God wants you healthy, God never wants you to be sick? Well, they like to hear that. You know, I found in the world today that the more sound your doctrine is, the less people you have. Generally speaking, that's the way it is. Of course, you might say, well, that's just sour grapes. I don't think so. But generally speaking, of course, there's a lot of factors of why you have few people or why a church has few people. But, but one thing is, generally speaking, in the world around us, it's a day of apostasy. It's a day where people, with their mouth, they show much love. They go after their covetousness. That's the world we have today. And the more sound you are, the less people you'll have. You know, in the New Testament it tells us the days will come in the end times, and most of us agree that we are in the end times, the day will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. And I love how that's put in the New Testament. They will not endure sound doctrine. They won't endure it. And even Christians, even people that call themselves Christians, they just won't endure really sound doctrine and sound preaching. Well, it was the same in the days of Ezekiel, the day of apostasy, and it's the same today. And I think we can find at least a bit of a comfort from that. And uh, we get, and we sit and we think, well, how come our church is so small, and how come we have these huge churches next door? Well, there's a big difference in what's being preached. There's a big difference in how the church is doing things. And back in Ezekiel's time, Ezekiel was by himself there. He was just by himself, being the watchman. In verse 32, And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play it well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And that's how it is today, and people go to church, and they're all religious, and it gives them a nice warm feeling. And it's great if they come to church and they cry and get emotionally worked up with the music, with, uh, with all the emotionalism. They love that. It's like a very lovely song of one that can play well on an instrument. But the only thing is, it really doesn't work anything in the heart. They hear thy words, but they do them not. And most of the cases, that's how it is today. Well, people think that today we can do just like in the book of Acts. In Brazil, I was in a Bible study there, and they were saying, well, in the book of Acts, they went out and preached the gospel, and thousands of people came in, and, and we need to go out, and we're, if we're faithful, uh, God will bring thousands of people in today. Well, it's a different day today. Today is a day of apostasy. Now, that doesn't mean we're supposed to sit back and do nothing. We're supposed to do what we can do. We're supposed to be busy for the Lord until the end. Of course, our friend Harold Camping, he had his uh, second wrong prediction of the Lord coming back. And he sa has said that the church age is over, people shouldn't go to church anymore, should sit back and wait for the Lord's return and listen to him. Well, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to keep on doing the Lord's work, keep on being watchmen. And even if people don't listen, we're supposed to still give warning from the Lord. Verse 33, And when this cometh to pass, when God's judgment comes, lo, it will come, and God's judgment will come into the United States and to Brazil if they don't turn back to the Lord, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. And they will know that whoever gave them warning of God's word and of turning to the Lord uh, was a true prophet of the Lord. And they should have listened to what he had to say. Now let's go back in chapter 33, back to chapter, verse 12. Therefore, thus, son of man, say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. 
When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live if he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. If the wicked return the pledge, give again that which he hath robbed, and walk in the statutes of life without, without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. And you know, here we have uh, Ezekiel giving warning to the children of Israel. And you know, here we see that uh, he was supposed to give warning both to the righteous and to the wicked. And you know, there were people that were righteous for a while, and then they turned away. And it's just like in the parable of the seed sower there with Jesus. The seed upon the stony ground, the seed upon the thorny ground. Uh, people, the seed rise up for a little while. They seem to be Christians for a little while. And yet they fall away and they never were true Christians. Well, that's what he's talking about here. And he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. And so we need to endure unto the end. We need to keep on serving the Lord till the end of our lives. And we need to be a watchman. A watchman. And then verse 8. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that the wicked man die in his iniquity, uh, that that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. And today we have the Great Commission. We have the same commission that Ezekiel had so many years ago. We need to go out and warn the wicked, warn the righteous as well, to turn to the Lord. And, uh, you know, it's a day of apostasy, a day where we're not going to have much in the way of good results, probably. But we need to keep on serving the Lord and pray that the Lord will give us some good results, and we hope for some good results. But we have to recognize that this is a day of apostasy, a day when... People will not endure sound doctrine. But let us go out and be the watchmen that we should, should be. And you know, when we do that, we fulfill the Great Commission and we deliver our soul. We do that which God would have us to do. So let us be busy in this day of apostasy. Let's bow in prayer. Oh Lord, we just thank Thee for Thy goodness unto us. We thank Thee for Thy Word. And we thank Thee that we can see so much from the life of Ezekiel, and from the preaching of Ezekiel, from the situation in the time of Ezekiel, that we, that we can see in our lands today. And oh Lord, help us to serve Thee each day that we live upon this earth until the end. In Jesus' name, Amen.